a gambling addiction. My grandfather is was an alcoholic when he was alive. Uh, there are other, uh, I have a brother, uh, he was a drug addict. You know, I, there's other people in my family, um, addicts. Alcoholism runs in our family. There's a lot of alcoholism in my family. And some are also drug addicts. And then I think, I think uh, it was in my genetics. And I think, uh, being exposed to drugs and alcohol because you you know it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't that wasn't a big thing just you know to see somebody drinking you know every every family event that we had there's always alcohol mm -hmm. and I think uh, you know for it to be so so accepted in our family I think it made it easier for me to start drinking. And then when I did start drinking, being, you know, in my family, when you drank to excess, people didn't really see it as a problem because they were doing the same thing. Um, I grew up in South Phoenix, off of 16th Street and Rosier in that area. Um, I grew up in the 70s, so yeah, it was, I would say it was, Everybody smoked marijuana. I mean, you go outside and you could, you could smell it everywhere. Uh, and I remember, at that time, I don't remember his name, but there was a doctor who was known to uh, you pay him enough money, he would, he was prescribe you. They called them diet pills. Mm -hmm. So it was diet pills and uh, Valium was mm -hmm. big back then. And as far as uh, alcohol, I mean, it was it was common too. You know, Friday afternoons. You know, the working class neighborhood, you get off work and buy some beer and go home and drink. The first time I got, I don't know if it was drunk or what, I was I was a kid. I was maybe uh, 10 or 11. And my mom had a, had a bottle of Kahlua and I caught my brother sneaking into it. And he told me that if you put it with milk, it tastes like chocolate milk. So that's what mm -hmm. we did, you know, and it tastes like chocolate milk. And then she found out and then she, I remember she made me take a, take a straight shot of rum and I got sick. I didn't like the feeling. I didn't, I didn't drink again. I didn't even think about it until uh, high school. I was about 15 or 16. And I went out with a friend and some other guy's house and they had some beer and, you know, I, I got drunk, but I was so sick. I threw up the next, the next day. I felt so bad that even just the smell of alcohol would make me sick. And I didn't really touch it again until I was probably, uh, in my early twenties. Yeah. I didn't really start drinking again until I was probably about 22 because I, I turned 21. And I went and bought some beer just because I was 21. I didn't even want it. I just wanted to do it because I was 21. I would say when I first, yeah, when I first started uh, in either one of them, you know, maybe the first couple of weeks, the first month, I would call that the honeymoon phase. But I mean, it didn't, like I said, it only lasted a couple of weeks or so. Then after that, it was, it was just, uh, I kept trying to, I kept trying to recapture that feeling. So I kept drinking and then I kept, you know, getting high uh, to get that feeling again, but it never, never came back. <laughs> oh, I knew it was a problem. Like the, the first time I tried cocaine, I knew that night. It was gonna be a problem, you know. I, I 
I, I would say that I was addicted the first time I did it. Alcohol, maybe because alcohol was legal and so many people I knew drank, I didn't really think that much about it. That was just, you know, that's, that was, that's what men did. You worked mm -hmm. hard all week and you drank. Mm -hmm. You know, in my relationships and my marriages, that was, they, the women would always say, that was the biggest problem was the alcohol. I drank too much. Um, I didn't, uh, I, but I don't know, I, I really can't say that I saw it as, as a problem. You know, I was always, always blamed uh, somebody else. It was something else. You know, it was like, for example, my wife, ex-wife would say, oh, you drink too much, you know. Uh, she would say it's a problem, but I would say like, well, no, it's not the problem. You're the problem. I, I was drinking when you met me. You knew what you know. You knew what it was, um, and you accepted it. So don't tell me to stop. Don't tell me it's a problem now, you know. Hmm. But yeah, I, I never. No, well, I never really. I never really. I, don't know, I, I never really saw it as a problem. I think I, I just got tired of doing it. Hmm. Yeah. So you know when I did decide to. When I went and got the help, and actually decided to pay attention, uh, it wasn't like I said. It wasn't so much that I thought of a problem in my life. It's just I was, I was tired of it. I was tired of the way it made me feel. I was tired of um, the effects it was having on my life. You know, my job, my relationships, how much money it was costing, and I just knew it was. I just felt like it, it was. It was something better. Mm -hmm. There's something better out there for me, but I tell you, like what you say, the 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 straw that broke the camel's back. Um, me and my wife at the time, we separated, and it was primarily because of the alcohol. And I found myself I was living at a friend's house in a trailer in his backyard, right? I mean, it was, and it wasn't even a, a big trailer. I mean, it was a you know, this was the size of my bed, this couch right here. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, you know, what, what are you doing? And I remember laying there and looking up and like, man, you know, what are you doing? You know, this is what your life has come to. You know, you, you're too smart. You make too much money. Um, at, at that time, I know I was, um, I was planning my whole, my whole, life around drinking and getting high. You know, when I made a, a financial budget, drugs and alcohol was in the budget, you know. And I just, you know, I, I sat there and I'm thinking, I'm like, man, this is, this is crazy. This is nuts. This is not the way you were raised. This is not what, this is not the life that, that this is not why you were created. You know, God doesn't have you here to do this to yourself, you know. And, but with addiction, man, I just couldn't, I couldn't stop. I mean, I, I, I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't stop drinking. I couldn't stop getting high. Like I said, even though I'm living in this tiny trailer in somebody's backyard, my life, my wife is ready to leave. She filed for divorce. And this was the reason why, but I still kept doing it. I tried to stop several times. You know, like I said, I had the little the little tricks, you know, I'm only gonna take a certain amount of money to the bar and I'm gonna leave the rest in the car, leave it at home or but as soon as that money ran out, I knew where the other money was, I I'd go back and get it. You know, it just I I tried all that. Uh, I said, well, I'm spending too much money, so I'll just buy cheap liquor. And, you know, you buy the cheap, I don't know, I bought the cheap liquor, and I'm like, yeah, well, if I'm going to get drunk, I might as well get drunk on something good, and then I go buy what I wanted. So, um, 
I would say I probably, I probably tried every every trick in the book to stop. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, actually, now let me let me I'm be honest. I don't think I was trying to stop. I think I was just trying to control it. You know, uh, because I think now had I invested that time and energy into actually stopping instead of trying to control it, mm. I'd have been a lot better. Mm. Uh, and I, you know, we, we, we talk about the, uh, the physiological effects of alcohol on the body. The acronym is PAUSE, post-acute withdrawal syndrome. The first time I heard that, I'm like, oh, that's why everything I tried didn't work. Because I noticed, hey, I might be able to go a week, maybe a week and a half without drinking, but after that, something just came over me, and when I found out about pause, I'm like, oh, that's what that was. Mm-hmm. That's why, you know, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't do it on my own. Uh-huh. You know, I might be able to go a week or ten days, but after that, it was mm-hmm. back to uh, my old lifestyle. The first time I, I learned about it, I was going through a <clears throat> through an IOP program, an outpatient program, and that's when I first learned about it. You know, she and she she just talked about um, how drugs and alcohol, how it, it affected your brain chemistry, um, and you know you you know we we crave that feeling so. Um, because your brain had the inability to, to release it, you know, you went back to the drug or the alcohol to get that feeling again. Happy your life. Happy your you know, life. I remember there's a song, there's, there's a guy, his name is his name is Kim, K E M. Now at the time I didn't know this, but he had also suffered with alcoholism. And he has a song called Heaven. And one of the lyrics in the song is, the, the man I used to be is, is gone. He gave up his life so I could move on. And that's what I had to do. You know, I had to, basically I had to, I had to die. That person had to die in order for me in order for me to grow, and you know, because uh, I'm telling you, if, if I did, I don't know, you know, people talk about the grace of God, man, but I, I tell you, if uh, the road that I was on, it was only, only the grace of God that kept me alive. I mean, some of the situations I put myself in, I mean, that, you know, somebody once told me that you don't mix you don't mix cocaine and crystal meth, it'll kill you. Well, I thought, that sounded like a good high to me. And so I mixed it. I mean, and I didn't die, right? So it feels a situation like that, man, that's, that's, that's the only, that's the only the grace of God, you know, keeping me from killing my stupid self, you know, you know, when, when, when all the, the medical studies say that, hey, this is dangerous, and then I do it anyway, but I'm still here to talk about it. Mm-hmm. I did. I relapsed. I call them relapses. Um, I would say there may have been, in the past 10 years, they there may have been Three. Um, I think the longest one may have lasted um, maybe three weeks. Most of them are like you know a day or two. I remember you know I had I went out and I got drunk one night, and then I went to my dad's house the next day, and he told me he said, um, "Okay, it happened. That was yesterday. There's nothing you can do about it." You know, just learn from it and move on. And you know, one thing that I did learn in, in, in IOP, it told us that the relapse 
happens long before you start, long before you use the substance, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah, I, I, I'm I'm going to agree with that. You know, I think mine happened before. You know, I think I got a little bit too cocky, a little too arrogant. You know, that I I I had it under control, and you know, and I you know I can control it. I'm. I had a couple of drinks and go hurt me with that kind of thing. And, and next thing you know, I was off the rails. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I see God. I see God all, always there. And I, I'm a, for me. I'm gonna say when I when I stop listening, when I stop following direction. That's when this whole thing, you know, took a left. Um, you know, I and you know one one thing I, I when I, I I listen to other addicts, um, and I I mean I don't care if it's chemicals, uh, gambling, sex, food, whatever. They all seem to have. There's always one thing in common. There's always something inside of them that seems to be missing. And they try to fill that void with some outside substance. But God's love is there to fill that void. You don't have to fill that with drugs, alcohol, gambling, sex, or whatever. Um, and that, but I think when people, when they turn away that hole is still there, and they got to put something in there. Then that's when we get that's when we get these problems with with the addiction. That's when I got my problem. You know, the best thing you can do. Um, they say the first step is to admit that you have a problem. You know, I was. You, you admit you have a problem, then, man. You gotta depend on God, you know, for your strength and your power. I mean, you just have to know that, you know, the scriptures tell us that we were made in His image. You know, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Why would you want to think about that? Why would you want to? Why would you want to destroy it? Why would you want to kill it? You know, you wasn't you wasn't made to be a drug addict and alcoholic. Uh, you wasn't made to live that that type of uh, destructive lifestyle. You know, if you find yourself in that situation, I'm telling you, there's uh, there's nothing that you can do in, in your power to fix it. It's only through God's grace and mercy that you can be healed and this thing can be turned around.